Hello again, folks. This is Professor Watts. Welcome back to Finance for Managerial Decision Making. Today we're going to do financial statement analysis. Let's jump in. And what we're doing with financial statement analysis is ratios. Ratios allow us to look at the numbers on financial statements and determine the health and performance of the corporation. Five categories of ratios, we're only going to delve uh, deeply into four of them. Profitability, liquidity, debt, asset activity, and market value. Okay, so let's get started with profitability ratios. We're measuring how good the company is at making money, at uh, creating value for its customers, keeping its costs low, and cranking out net income. So the question is, how effective is the firm at generating revenue in excess of its cost of goods sold? Gross profit margin, gross profit divided by sales. It's just saying what percent of all of our sales, the top line on the income statement, remember, is our gross profit. And for our example company here, Excalibur Corporation, we have a gross profit of 575, and we might say, uh, think of these as probably being in millions if this is a really large company. So 575 million in gross profit, sales of 1.45 billion. And so we just do that math there, 575 over 1450. And we see that about 40% of sales is represented by gross profit. In other words, we can think that cost of goods sold is about 60% of sales, and the remainder is gross profit. Of course, we still have to cover operating expenses, depreciation, and, and maybe some miscellaneous other expenses. And notice that uh, when we do profitability ratios, the, the slide here is showing both the balance sheet and the income statement. This one is strictly an income statement ratio. Some ratios look at balance sheet items, some ratios look at income statement items, and some are actually mixed. Okay, next we're going to look at the operating profit margin, closely related to gross profit margin, and the question here is how effective is the firm in keeping cost of production low? Operating profit margin is defined as operating income over sales. And so now, instead of looking at uh, just gross profit divided by sales, we're going to look at operating income divided by sales. And again, we're thinking in terms of what percent of sales is operating income, 22.8%. Of course, it's going to be lower than gross profit because we're now covering operating expenses and depreciation. Okay, and this firm is still making uh, a decent operating profit margin. Of course, when we ask the question, is this a good profit margin or not, the answer is really always kind of it depends. You know, it's nice for it to be positive, of course. A positive ratio here means that the company is profitable. It's not losing money. Uh, it's nice for this to be in the double digits, but we really want to compare this both to this company over time and the trend. Is it on an uptrend or a downtrend? And then compare it to peer companies. If uh, competitors have an operating margin of 20%, we're going to say, great, we're doing better than the competitors. But if our operating profit margin was in the was 25% in the past several years, well, now it looks like it's on a downtrend, so maybe it's not such great news after all. Okay, then finally, with profitability, the net profit margin. And the question we're asking here is how much net profit is being generated from each dollar of sales. And of course, this is the bottom line profitability ratio. We're looking at net income divided by sales. And for our same example company here, right? look, we're down at the bottom line of the income statement. And we're dividing net income of 162 million divided by the total sales, 1450. And we're at 11.2. Okay. Now, is that a good ratio? Well, hey, it's positive. It's double digits. So, you know, it's kind of on the surface, it's good. But again, we've got to compare it to this company over time and to competitor companies to see where we fall in that distribution. Okay, now just to kind of put these profit margin ratios side by side from gross operating down to net, and you'll see that the trend is that as we go from gross to operating to net, the ratio always decreases. And that's just based on the logic of we're including more and more costs here. And in net profit margin, of course, we're including all costs. So the question you might be wondering is, well, why would we care about these different ones? Isn't net profit margin the only thing that matters? Well, not really. And you know, we can kind of think about this as we're, we're slicing this up according to different cost categories. Gross profit margin is, is addressing the issue of how well we're covering what we might view as production costs. Operating margin, of course, looks at how, we're, how well we're covering operating costs. And the net profit margin, of course, looks at how well we're covering total costs. And we might want to look at, at you know production costs in terms of gross profit margin. You know, how how well are we covering simply cost of goods sold? We might think we have an issue just in production and not in you know op total operations in terms of administrative expenses, just strictly in production expenses. Well that would pop up in this ratio. And if this ratio was low relative to the to the entire industry that would tell us something, you know, we need to maybe go in and kind of look at our production process, look for efficiencies, and that kind of thing. So it is useful analytically within the firm to look at gross and operating margin. Of course, investors probably mainly care about this, you know, they'll leave the internal stuff to management, 
So, so management might be more focused on this stuff. These are kind of internal ratios. We can look at this one as an, an external one that's going to be of interest to outside investors as well. Okay, now a few more items with profitability ratios. When we're asking the question of how effectively is the firm generating net income from its assets, now you might be thinking, well, didn't we just address that with the net profit margin? Well, kind of, but there's another angle of this, which is the return on assets, which is now taking net income divided by total assets, not divided by total sales. And basically the question here is, basically the question here is what percent of the total assets that the investors have put into the company, that's ultimately some combination of equity, stockholders, and, and debt, creditors, investors, of what they've put into the company for the asset base that they use to produce their products and services, how much of it do they get back in the given year in the form of profits? Well, for our example company here, the net income of 162 divided by the total assets here from now it's a mixed, uh, this is a mixed ratio. because we're taking one item from the income statement and dividing it by one item from the balance sheet. And we can see that this works out to 6.4%. So how do we want to think about that? Well, of all the assets investors have put into the company, they get 6.4% back this year in the term of raw profits, pure profits. Good or bad, again, kind of compares to what they were expecting, what they could get in alternative investments. We'll talk a lot about calculating things based on alternative prospects, what we could have earned, what we think we might have earned investing our money in other things. To help us think about this, you know, pop up a calculator here and think about if we're making 6.4% of the assets invested in the company back in raw profits this year, we divide that into 100%. And that basically tells us how many years it would take at this level of performance to get the total investment back. It's going to take 15 years at that rate to get the total investment back because we get 6.4% of it back per year. And that just really gives us another angle of thinking about this investment. If I have another investment where I get my invested funds back in 10 years and then after that it's pure profit, this one's giving me my funds back in 15 years. So that might shine some light on whether this is a worthy investment or not. And when I say worthy investment, we're talking about you know owning shares in this company. Okay, then finally with profitability, on a related note to the return on assets, is return on equity, which is asking how well is the firm generating returns strictly to its equity providers? And that's taking net income divided not, not by total assets now, but just by equity. And of course, this is always going to be higher than return on assets because we're stripping out the part portion of the assets that was funded by debt. In the case of this company, we can see that uh, total debt here is about 800 some billion, million. And that leaves 1,700 of the assets that are funded by equity, by ownership claims, by stockholders. So the requisite math here, net income divided by equity, 162 divided by that 1,700, gives us a 9.53%. And it's typically going to be the case for companies that are using debt wisely that the return on equity is going to be larger than their return on assets. If the return on equity is not significantly larger than return on assets, that kind of raises the issue for investors as to why is this company not using any debt at all. There are some good reasons to use debt. Of course, there's risk of using too much, but uh, there's some tax privileges and some other, uh, there's leverage and there's some reasons that debt is, is sensible. So the difference between return on equity and return on assets kind of by itself is an indicator of how well a company is using debt. So you can already see that ratios never stand alone. We kind of want to look at a ratio in comparison to itself over time, uh, one ratio in comparison to another ratio. There's a whole lot of different ways we can use ratios together to come up with a lot of meaningful insights. We're really kind of only scratching the surface uh, in this lecture, but I want to just give us an overview of the different families and flavors of ratios that are out there for us to use. Okay, so now let's move on and talk about liquidity ratios. Liquidity ratios measure the ability of the firm to meet its short-term financial obligations. You can think of them as addressing the question, how liquid is the company, meaning how much cash does it have or can it have in a short period of time to pay its current uh, liabilities to keep itself going? Are there sufficient current assets to pay off current liabilities? What is the cushion of safety? Well, that is addressed by the current ratio, which is just taking all the current assets divided by all the current liabilities. And of course, you can kind of think of a natural benchmark for this number. If, if this is less than one, the company's probably in trouble. It doesn't have enough current assets to meet current liabilities. You know, if this is less than one. So we might kind of think of a target for this. A, a minimum boundary is one. And a, most analysts say that, you know, it's, it's really healthy to be at, at two or higher. And our company here has 1.2 billion of assets, well, you know, quite a bit of cash, a ton of accounts receivable, and a good amount of inventory. 
and only 230 million in, in current liabilities. So we're at a uh, current ratio of over five, very healthy. Closely related to the current ratio is a, something called the quick ratio, which just, it is the current ratio, except we're stripping inventory out of current assets. A kind of, again, rule of thumb is uh, two or more is healthy. Uh, once we strip out inventory, we see that we're dealing with about 600 over 230. So our current ratio is 2.63. On the surface, that looks fairly healthy. But again, we want to compare to ourselves over time and to competitor firms to see where we are in the mix. Okay, moving on now, debt ratios. Debt ratios measure the relative size of the firm's debt load and the firm's ability to pay off its debt. We kind of drill down a little bit more with the debt ratios to see if a firm is over indebted. And the first thing is just a basic debt ratio, total debt to total assets. So we find the total debt, which is the sum of the current and long-term liabilities, so 230 plus 600, divided by the total assets over here, which we had before. And we see that for this firm, it's, uh, it's a relatively low 33%. Kind of a benchmark here is that if this ratio, if, if your debt ratio, if it's greater than one or if it gets close to one, uh, you're probably in trouble. You're financing your whole operation with debt. You have very little equity stake, and that could be a sign of being over leveraged and too exposed to, to debt, which of course is very risky, and we'll talk more about that later on. And then we'll look at the debt to equity ratio, which divides total debt by just equity. What proportion of debt relative to equity is financing the firm? And in the case of our example company, Again, the total debt, this is a 230 short-term plus 600 long-term debt, divided by total equity now, which is just 1700. So our debt to equity ratio is a little bit higher than our just basic debt ratio. It's approaching 49%. Is that good, bad, and different? Again, it kind of depends on the company, the industry, comparison to peers. But we don't want this getting too high. You know, once this gets higher than probably 50, 60, it could vary by industry, that might be a sign of over-indebtedness. So this company is probably okay, but they might be on the cusp of having too much debt. Okay, now finally we're going to look at market value ratios. We're asking the question, how much are investors willing to pay per dollar earnings of the firm? And this is a sign of investors' attitudes towards future prospects of the firm. This is a really useful tool when you're looking at a company's stock from an investor standpoint, and then internally uh, to gauge what the stock market thinks of your company and your future prospects. Of course, stock markets are always forward-looking. They don't necessarily care about your past performance because that's already done, that's gone. What they care about is what can you do for me starting today? What kind of dividends can you pay me going forward? What kind of value can you create going forward? Which is going to lead to either increases or declines in the stock value. So there's, there's a few different ones here, but the most important one, and the only one we'll focus on right now, is price to earnings ratio or P to E ratio. It's market price per share of stock divided by the earnings per share. Now the earnings per share, we have to, that's a separate calculation that we have to do. It's pretty straightforward. We just take the net income of the company, in this case 162 million, and then divide it by the total shares outstanding. And look, this is 100 million shares, right? No, no company actually would only have 100 shares. So we got 100 million shares out there and they're trading at $20 per share. So that's where that share price feeds in to the top of this ratio. And then the earnings per share, which is total earnings divided by number of shares outstanding, $162 million divided by 100 million shares. And you know we, we might just break that out here. Earnings per share equals $1.62. So 20 divided by 1.62, our P to E is 12.3. And the way Wall Street will talk about this, if you ever watch the financial news on TV, they'll say that it's trading at a 12.3 multiple to earnings, or sometimes they'll just talk about the P-E ratio. And again, we'll ask the question, is that good, bad, and different? Well, of course it depends. It depends on what the rest of the market's doing. It depends on what the rest of the industry is doing, comparative alternative possible investments. Okay, so that sums it up for the ratios we want to look at right now. As I mentioned, there's a whole lot of other ones, but, but this will be enough for us for now. A lot to chew on. And all we want to do in the remainder of this lecture is kind of size up our example company by comparing its ratios to competitors. As I mentioned, uh, ratios don't really stand or fall on their own. Some of them do to a certain extent, but we want to compare them to the industry averages. So there's kind of some made up numbers in our example here, but when we look at gross profit margin, you know, Excalibur is beating the industry, you know, so that looks good. We'll say nice. Uh, also beating the industry and operating profit margin. Looks good. A little bit lower on net profit margin. Okay, so what's going on there? So what this says is we, you know, we have operating efficiencies in terms of just covering our production expenses, and we're really good in terms of our operating costs, but 
net profit when it comes to total cost, when it comes to maximizing efficiency over the entire operation, and that includes things like taxes and interest and everything else that we have to pay, we're a little bit lagging behind the industry there. And so maybe time to look for some tax efficiencies, uh, some financial efficiencies in terms of reducing our interest burden and things of that nature. So it really d it is really useful as you can see already I, I know some things about this company without really knowing any details about their operations just by looking at the ratios comparing them to the industry return on assets is lagging pretty significantly behind the industry that tells me we're not utilizing our asset base really well it might be time to sell off some some non-performing assets might be time to trim down that asset base a little bit so we can boot if we could get the same level of sales with a little bit leaner asset profile we could probably get this ratio up so I've got some managerial insights again. And then the return on equity is, is lagging substantially as well, which means that my stockholders aren't getting as much bang for their buck here as they could in these other companies. And that means unless we turn things around and improve performance, they're probably going to abandon Excalibur Company and look to buy shares in the other companies in the industry. So that's a, a pretty strong motivation for the executives and management of this company to get their act together and improve their financial performance. Looking at liquidity, we see that uh, Excalibur's current ratio, I, I mentioned that that's a really strong current ratio and it's a little bit above the industry average. The asset test, also known as the quick ratio, a uh, little bit below industry trends. This doesn't worry me too much. It's above that rule of thumb of two, but it could be a little bit better compared to the rest of the industry. Uh, creditors might look at this and say, you know, Excalibur needs to, to get a little more liquid to give creditors peace of mind that even if there was some kind of downturn in the industry, uh, Excalibur is still going to be able to pay its bills in the short run. Looking at debt ratios, um, pretty much in line with industry averages in terms of the basic debt ratio, debt to equity. Times interest earns, we didn't really cover that, but that's basically just taking net income and dividing it by the interest payments for the past year. And that means we could have paid our interest five, five and a half times over. And creditors, again, are going to look at that to to see if we're a viable credit risk. That's a little bit sluggish behind the rest of the industry, but I don't think that number in itself is, is too bad of a sign. And finally, market value ratios. Well below the P to E ratio, or the earnings multiple for the rest of the industry. We didn't cover market to book, so we'll just kind of forget about that for now. So that tells me that the market is not valuing this company as highly as the industry. And that really jibes with what we talked about here where our return on equity is lower so we would expect if the return on equity is lower the market the stock market's not willing to pay as much for Excalibur shares because they don't have as high a return and hence the earnings multiple is considerably lower than that for the rest of the industry so there you have it there's a, a little introduction to some of the more important ratios and what we'll do next is dive into some homework problems and calculate ratios in Excel and compare ratios across companies within companies over time. We'll also look at some examples of, of ratio analysis for real companies. For instance, here you can see I've gone on the Morningstar website. I've pulled up Ford Motor Company, and I've got all their financials here going back to 2007. And uh, Morningstar actually calculates the ratios for me. So I can take a look at how their ratios have stack up over time. For instance, you can see the gross margin here over time, uh, operating margin profitability, here's the net margin, return on assets, return on equity, and so forth. So there's a wealth of ratio analysis that's actually out there. It's all, The ratios have already been calculated for you. It's just a matter of knowing how to use them. So we'll work with that a little bit in uh, forthcoming lectures. See you then.